Hello everyone, and welcome back to Reentry and Orbital Simulator. We are going to continue the Academy missions for Project Mercury, and I'm looking to do Lesson 5, 6, 7, and the Examination. Hopefully I can get through all that, but there's more content now than there was before, so I don't know exactly how long it'll take. Let's take a look at the Attitude Control System and see how that works. Okay, welcome to Reaction Control System Tutorial. In this lesson, we will take a look at the various systems of the Mercury capsule that help stabilize it, as well as changing attitude relative to Earth. And we can see automatic attitude control. We can actually sort of see a thruster firing there. Um, Alright. Mercury space capsule comes equipped with a few systems to keep it stable and to control its attitude. To do this, it needs to know where Earth's horizon is. Two mechanical... Uh, spelling. Uh, components called the... Uh, Horizon scanners are detecting this. Earth emits a lot of radiation, space does not. These scanners detect where a sudden drop in radiation happens when the scanner goes from the threshold between Earth and space. Uh, one Horizon scanner is used for pitch, the other is for roll. Uh, these are operated at a frequency, so if you see a sudden change in pitch and roll, this is the reason. Okay. Uh, the capsule comes with three gyroscopes that indicate the attitude and three accelerometers for rate indication. These can be slaved to the horizon scanner to get relative data to Earth's horizons. Or Earth's horizon. Uh, this is how it knows its orientation in space. The pitch horizon scanner can only look forward with a field view of 35 degrees plus or minus. Uh, same with roll, but it looks to the side. If you are outside of the horizon scanner's field of view, the gyros will revert to free mode. When the gyros are in free mode, the attitude will change based on thruster changes. This can induce an error in the attitude. When the horizon is detected, they will snap back in slave mode and you will see a jump in the attitude indicators. To automatically control the spacecraft in various situations, a system called ASCS, Automatic Stabilization Control System, now they give the uh, expansion of the acronym, is used. In this mode, the spacecraft should be able to orient itself and keep a given attitude based on the spacecraft's phase in the mission. To maintain or change the attitude, the spacecraft is using something called RCS, Reaction Control System. This system can be controlled by the ASCS, a Backup Rate Stabilization Control System, RSCS, or by manual control. The RCS consists of many thrusters that can alternate, then al okay, that can alter, probably, the spacecraft's orientation. These are the thrusters that are used to change pitch roll, yaw, or modify the capsule's angular rates. The capsule can be oriented and controlled by either automatic mode using ASCS or three astronaut controlled modes, fly-by-wire, manual propulsion, and RSCS. First, let's focus on the ASCS, then move back to the other modes later. The ASCS systems establish and maintain a stable platform with four automatic modes, damper, orientation, attitude hold, and re-entry. Uh, first, let's get familiar with these controls. In the virtual cockpit, press F6 to move the camera to the stabilization control panel. That I think is over here, but let's see what F6 does. Yeah, it's over here. Uh, let me just go back to commander's seat and just look over here. I'm using track IR. Uh, a rectangle called ASCS mode select. Oh, sorry, rectangle. Uh, with three switches, configures the system in conjunction with four pull handles. Uh, black manual pull handle, that one, uh, and three white handles for pitch, uh, roll, and yaw. So roll, yaw, and pitch there. Currently the system is configured to use the ASCS to control the spacecraft fully automatic. This means it will slave the gyros to the horizon scanners, use the automatic RCS system to orient, and maintain the spacecraft in retro attitude. Two switches need to be in position to enable full automatic mode. First of all, ASCS must be set to Norm, okay? And the middle one needs to be set to Auto. Lastly, the black manual handle must be in, like it is currently, unless you messed around. Ah, they know me. Uh, <laughs> in this mode, uh, the automatic phase shifter system decides the orientation, 
This system is what rotates... Let me recenter a bit. Uh, this system is what rotates the spacecraft 180 degrees in yaw after launch vehicle separation, automatically orients the spacecraft after rotation, maintains orientation, and rolls the spacecraft before re-entry. There are two RCS systems, one for automatic control and uh, called System A, and one for manual controls called System B. The automatic ASCS mode we just talked about is using the auto RCS, and again, those have different propellant. There's a propellant amount over here. So the middle auto switch decides what RCS system to use. System A uses two thruster settings, either low or high. System B has variable thruster strength based on how far you push the stick. Each of the RCS systems, this is, a lot of this is new compared to the last time I did the Mercury stuff. Each of the RCS systems has their own fuel tank as indicated on the control fuel gauge. Left is auto, right is manual. A low fuel warning light will be visible if one of the tank, it, tanks is below 25%. If ASCS fails or you need to manually take control of the automatic RCS system, you can use the fly-by-wire mode. This enables you to use your stick to control the attitude. In this mode, you can either fire the low thrust or high thrust based on how far you push the stick. Using keyboard, you can only fire the low thrust manually. I will have a joystick, so... Um, Alright, fly-by-wire... Uh, more? Yeah. Okay, well, I'll just use my stick. Okay, it is reversed, actually. But we're going retrograde, so maybe that has an effect. Notice that you are burning fuel from the automatic RCS system. In order to use small thrusts, you have very limited fuel. If you have time, it's better to use small thrust and a slow rate to get to your desired orientation. You can set the ASCS mode to AUX ON to enable auxiliary dampening. A system will automatically damp out any attitude rates down to 0.5 degrees per second. If you want the spacecraft to stand still, select this mode. Uh, well, it didn't have to do much. Might still have some rates after flyby wire fly-by-wire mode, if not, create some using fly-by-wire first. Uh, well, let's try and turn all the way. And then go to Oxon. I want to see the Earth again. Okay, Earth is coming up. Oh, I'm through my seat. Okay. And it canceled them out. It didn't have any audible thruster firing, though. That did cancel out the change in orientation. If you want to go to fully manual propulsion system, first set the ASCS to norm. Or aux, it doesn't matter. For now, we can use norm. All right, norm. Then set the middle one to rate command. And then pull out the manual. So left is in, right is out. In this mode, you'll be able to thrust manually in all directions. This system is available even if the electrical system should fail. Try to change the attitude a bit using... Well, I'm not going to use the keys. Again, the pitch seems reversed, so I wonder if I can change that right now. I, I don't know, is that supposed to change the directionality of it? Let me see. Yeah, okay, I think I've got uh, that little button that has the swirl, I guess, whatever you want to call it, changes it to inverted. I might have accidentally pushed it already and that's why it was already inverted. We should be using manual fuel now, right? Or not? Maybe we have to switch something else to get manual fuel. 
Now let's uh, face the earth. Okay. Fully automatic, fly by wire, and manual mode. The last is RSCS. RSCS is a semi automatic mode, it enables you to change attitude using the stick. If the stick is centered, it will stop any. So it's basically SAS in Kerbal. First, set the mode switch to norm. That is norm. Set the middle one to rate command. It is. And then put this in. So now it's in. Well, it's not doing what I expected. Hmm. Uh, that is on norm. Let me just that back to norm. I'll toggle this. So I'm continuing to turn. It can limit the maximum angular rate, but it doesn't actually fully stop me the way like a Kerbal SAS would. I'm doing that myself. It brings me back to some moderate amount when I go too far, but it still allows the turn to continue unless I stop it. Maybe they meant it should be aux? I don't know. No. I mean, because now they're telling me to go to norm. It was already on norm. That's on norm. This one needs to be on auto. Okay. And now... My own controls don't do anything. Because the manual is in, and we're no longer in the rate command mode. Okay. Combine manual and ASCS. To do this, you still need the mode switch to norm, and the auto switch to auto position. Okay, that one, yeah. And then pull this out. Okay, what does that do? Still be in fully automatic mode. But if you pull out any of the pitch yaw or roll handles, that select axis will be in manual mode. So that way the ASCS can tr control the other two, but you can control the one. So if you want to make sure that it controls the roll, uh, I want to control the pitch uh, out his right. So I can control the pitch now. But my yaw, which I'm trying to use, doesn't work. And my roll doesn't work. Okay. And we can put that in again. I already did all that. Yep. There are more configurations available, but these are the ones you really need to understand. The others are something you can get creative about after learning the basics. Okay. Uh, ASCS is the autopilot. Attitude is defined by the gyros and horizon scanners. RCS is a system that fires the thrusters. It's made up of system A and B. A is automatic, B is manual. They can be combined. RCS is controlled by the autopilot, manually by fly-by-wire. RSCS or MP. MP? Uh... We'll just ignore that for now. Advanced lesson, but it's important to understand how to control the capsule, obviously. I would recommend checking the RCS chapter in the Mercury Flight Manual, too. Okay, so we are done with that. Alright, next up. The staying alive part. <laughs> Let me just check. It's got me all completed for everything else. Okay, staying alive. Okay, environmental control system lesson. That's what they meant by staying alive. There are many things that contribute to staying alive, I guess. That is one of them. ECS has one primary job, uh, to keep you alive during uh, in normal Earth-like conditions. Uh, this means providing oxygen, regulating temperature, as well as providing water, cleaning the air, and so on. Oxygen is supplied at 5.5 PSI in the cabin and has two circuits. One through the cabin, one through the suit. Sort of gone through this. Launch pad, the cabin is filled with pure oxygen at 16 PSI. This bleeds off by atmospheric pressure during ascent. 
Temperature is regulated by coolers, amount of equipment, and a small scale of the capsule requires... Uh, what? Okay, the amount of equipment and the small scale of the capsule, okay, the small size of the capsule, requires coolers to keep a set temperature. Temperature can be regulated by using selectors. They are located on the panel just below the hatch. Okay, these are the cooler switches over here. The There are two environmental circuits, one for the cabin, one for the suit. They keep mentioning this. Uh, air flows through these circuits. Each system has uh, each has systems to keep them fresh. Uh, water is used as a coolant. Two heat exchangers, one for each circuit, is used to regulate temperature. Air is pushed through the cabin and the suit by three fan systems, one for the cabin, two for the suit, one primary and one backup. Uh, the backup fan will automatically start if the primary fan stops. We have two switches for controlling the fans. First, we have the one for turning the cabin fan on or off. If this is off, the cabin temperature will increase. Keep it on. That's that one right there. Uh, I want to keep all the fans on. Uh, then we have the switch for manual control of the suit circuit. You can choose between the norm, uh, number one for primary fan, number two for backup fan. After atmospheric entry, the oxygen emergency mode will initiate. This will provide fresh oxygen through the snorkel at a fixed rate. And that bypasses the fans and heat exchanger. This will trigger an alarm that can be muted using the O2 emergency tone switch. All switches, and so that's that one right there. Uh, all switches in this row can be used to mute alarms. So those are the alarms, excess suit water, excess cabin water, fuel quantity, retro warning, and retro reset, and we can switch off the tones with those switches. You can check the amount of oxygen you have left by using the oxygen gauge. You have two oxygen tanks, uh, one primary and one secondary. These are controlled automatically, so that's highlighted there. If the cabin pressure is outside the normal range, below 5.5 PSI, an alarm will sound. Again, you can silence alarms by the correct tone switch on the right side of the main panel. If you need it, you can depress the cabin from oxygen by pulling pulling the decompress handle. Try this now. No! Well, I have my suit still. Ah! Pressure, cabin pressure is rapidly decreasing and alarm will sound. Silence it by the correct alarm switch. Okay. Now we can step outside. <laughs> uh, stop the venting of the cabin air, push the handle back in. You can repressurize the cabin by pulling the repress handle out. Until the, So right now it's uh, close to zero PSI. And let's see if the oxygen drops when I pull that out. Cabin O2 is going up. Yes, the oxygen system primary is going down. And the cabin pressure is going up. Okay. I only have a little pressure suit. It's not a full EVA suit, so it probably wouldn't be good to step outside. When it is at 5.5, push the handle back in. So we could theoretically repress to less than 5.5. Okay, that's in. Remember to check your oxygen levels frequently. Well, okay, now that took a lot out. That took like a third of our oxygen to repress. Our right panel lets you control the temperature. Okay, and what is our temperature anyway? Suit environment. Um, we're like at 88 degrees Fahrenheit, it looks like. And then the cabin is at 80. So the suit's at 88, the cabin's at 80. When you're on the sunny side of the orbit, temperature will increase, and on the dark side, it will decrease. Use these in conjunction with the temperature gauge. Electrical components, so darn it. I want the cabin temp lower, right? Um, this is actual temperature, it's, uh, or sh should I turn up the cooler? I'm not, not entirely clear whether I should turn up the cooler. I guess we'll find out. Inverter temp, probably I don't need to touch. Suit temp and cabin temp, let's see what happened. Okay, turning that down increased the temperatures. So actually, when it says temp, it means the fan power, I think. Uh, 
They're going down slowly, but they are going down. Let me turn that all the way up, darn it. Get that temperature down. I wonder if it increases the uh, amp consumption. Oh, uh, it hit a minimum at 70 there. The cabin temperature is going down, though. So the cabin doesn't go for a minimum. Uh, cabin's going to 50. All right, let's hold on there. That has it going up. And actually, my suit environment temperature has gone up beyond 80 again, so... I'm trying to find where the nice neutral position is, but... That might have to do. I don't know if it changed the power levels to increase the fan level. Anyway, electrical components produce heat too, so it is important to pay attention to the various indicators you have. Well, to learn what the normal ECS levels are to understand when something is wrong, check the gauges frequently. Well, we got the cabin a little bit cooler, and that's an, accompl an accomplishment. Okay, so sequencer, the programmer. What controls the stage or phase of the mission you are in from launch to re-entry and landing? Took a lot of power. We actually switched off the sequencer or the programmer during the power one just to see how much the power would drop and the power consumption dropped a lot. Okay, welcome to the sequencer tutorial. Once again, it's automatically maneuvering me a lot. Okay, I I'm annoyed by that. I'm going to switch it to fly-by-wire and manual, <laughs> just so it doesn't do that all the time. Okay, I'll remember to put it back, don't worry. It handles all automatic events and the ACSC, uh, ASCS mode by providing power to various systems. Programmer controls the sequence system, the system that controls all of the major events in the states a mission consists of. It has a simple user interface where a column of indicators displays the current state. Like those. The indicator is a list of lights on the left side of the panel. Each light has three states, unlit, normal, and pending. Unlit means the event has not happened or not relevant anymore. Normal indi is indicated by a green light, means the event executed normally. And pending is indicated by the red light and means that the event is about to happen, is processing, or has failed. The light uh, will switch to green when completed. Failures will remain red. Let's quickly go through what each indicator represents. Okay. Ah. Jet tower indicates that the tower is about to be jettisoned. It will illuminate red a few seconds before jettison and then turn green if it's okay. Capsule set will illuminate red a few seconds before capsule separation from the launch vehicle will turn green if separation is okay. Retro, retro sequence will turn red when the retro sequence has started and green when completed. It is started when the time to retro timer reaches zero or the execu execute button next to the light is pressed. Retrograde is what enables you to fire the retro engines for re-entry. The retro sequence will normally start a few seconds before ignition. Retro delay switch. In norm means the retro fire sequence will start 30 seconds after retro sequence illumination or instantly if it's on INST. The retro attitude indicator shows you're in the correct attitude for uh, required for automatic retro fire. It will not fire automatically if the capsule is outside the range of retro attitude. That's good. We would not want to burn in the opposite direction. Yeah, so red is outside the correct attitude, green is inside. Retro attitude switch can be used to bypass the retro attitude requirement. This is useful if there are malfunctions in the gyros, attitude, or ASCS systems. Fire retro will be red 10 seconds before retro engines are fired. The retros can be fired manually by pressing the button to the right, and that also has a case around it. 
It will be green when fire retro is completed. On the other side of the panel, uh, the retro warn and tone will indicate that the retro is about to start. Cancel if something is wrong. That's the tone, though, there. 60 seconds after retro fire, the retro and retro engines will be jettisoned. Retro jet will be red two seconds before jettison and green if jettison is okay. After retro jettison, place attitude select switch to re-entry so ASCS can position the capsule to the re-entry attitude automatically. Do this now to learn how the craft reacts. Okay, now I need to get it back into normal auto and push that puppy in. Okay, it's done something. Let me switch to that. I don't know if it's changed anything, to be honest. Oh, now it's doing something. Okay, yeah, now it's turning around. Be prepared to help the ASCS with attitude, manual attitude control, especially when setting the switch. Okay, we want to verify that it's looking very retrograde. Let's just go outside to see. Yep, that's retrograde, so it turned it properly. Okay. 0.05G will illuminate when deceleration is detected. ASCS will set the capsule into a roll for a more stable re-entry. Drogue will be manually deployed by pressing the button manually deployed. Note, we actually have to press that button next to the drogue indicator. Snorkel will let outside air enter the cabin and set the O2 emergency mode on. A tone and indicator will indicate this. Main will deploy the main chutes. You can manually deploy this by the button next to the indicator. This accounts for reserve 2 if main fails. Landing bag will illuminate when the landing bag is extended, making the capsule ready for impact and landing. A switch next to the button in auto will deploy it automatically 5 seconds after main shoot or instantly at man. Oh, uh, sorry, my knee. Oh, uh, so there's a switch here that's on auto and then man uh, we can go to manual if you want to do it instantly. So 5 seconds after the main shoot is when it's supposed to happen. Okay, rescue indicates that your rescue equipment has been deployed. A switch can be positioned so it is deployed at splashdown or instantly. A set of fuses gives you more control too. Look at the description of them to learn what they do. Uh, for the programmer to be in operation, ensure the fuse is set to one or two. Okay, well, I'm surprised they didn't actually go through the re-entry under the circumstances. So... That means the first time we do re-entry will be on the full mission. Well, okay then. Alright, here we go for the full mission. Okay, welcome to the full mission lesson. This will take you into a suborbital flight with a retrograde burn and splashdown in the Atlantic. Oh, so this is not an orbital flight. Okay. First check the mission pad after ingress. Okay. And so let's just do the checklist per normal run. Let me just, uh, we could just move that away. So launch to ready and check. Okay, perform radio test on UHF. Let's bring out those buttons and say that's UHF. It's on low radio check. Okay, they read me. And we can check that off and verify that uh, time zero cover is removed. Okay. DC selector battery one. Yep, by the way. And that's 24 arm squib and arm retro jettison. Okay. And then we can use time scale. I guess we will this time. 5x and 10x. It should automatically pull us out of uh, time warp when it comes time. Okay, that's going too fast. <laughs> I'll pull myself out of time warp. Let me just scan around, make sure everything's okay. Okay, we've got a countdown. Look 
looking at the clock. Okay, it says one. They already say it, but I'll click that. Alright. Umbilical disconnect. I don't even know how I figure out whether the umbilical is disconnected. Okay, asset checklist. Well, they're just monitoring stuff, and then after engine cutout, we'll... Uh, well, it says start redstone ascent checklist after engine cutout. Well, I guess it's just monitoring things, so... Alright. Uh, so we see cabin pressure dropping down, which is nominal. Still say my suit temp is high, but... Well, they said before I did, but yeah, it is at 5.5. Now on the real missions, once the engine cut out and they separated the capsule from the redstone, they did some maneuvering in order to test out the maneuvering system for the eventual orbital flights. Oh, and speaking of engine cut out, that was at 2.09. 2.14 I think was the normal limit. Okay, well, it should automatically do things. Redstone. Oh. Cut off. Yep. Green. Twenty seconds after Miko. Well, that's way more than two ten. Okay. And capsule separation. Okay. And then we can turn off the auto retro jettison switch. And get the fuse switch off. It's that one. Okay, emergency retro and fuse switch. Uh, where was that? Oh, um, that's the fuse. Let's see. Um, uh, we got that. Got that. Okay. Where is that one? Ah, there. Okay. Alright, start orbital checklist. Well, it's not orbital. That was the redstone thing. We don't want to start the orbital checklist. Right? Right. I think so. Well, we're uh, or already oriented retrograde. Retro is only a couple of minutes away. We could explore using RCS, but... Well, it says, okay, prepare for retro and pre-retro checklist. Okay. Well, alright. Um, retro... Pre-retro first. Okay. Suit temp. Okay, so we pump up the fans, it looks like. And inverter temp. Okay, well, fine. Okay, now we have to get the retro stuff back in. Because that has to be dumped soon. Uh, main fuse, true. Maintain retro attitude auto or manual and then start retro checklist. Just turn them off and turn them back on again. Start retro checklist. Five minutes to retro. Oh, we're already doing stuff. Let me get the auto retro stuff. Okay, yeah, all green, firing the retros, a little bit late on everything. Let me switch that pad off for now. Audible tone, yeah, we had the audible tone, and then it's firing, and it's amber while firing. And it's green while completed, just in retro. Hopefully I've got everything in the right position for that. Armed to that already. Those are in a good position. Start re entry checklist. 
Auto retro switch arm. Yeah. After retro jettison. Well, we're still waiting for that. Do I have to manually jettison it? Oh, nope, it did it. Okay, yes. Add to select re-ent. Okay. And then we wait for 0.05 G's. And just make sure that we are oriented properly. Uh, yeah, because we're suborbital, it's not normal flat retrograde. I mean, you get the view selector, external view. We're still sort of hanging really close to the booster. Uh, I can't manipulate. Okay. Oh, no, that's the retro pack. That's the retro pack. It's like this. Not too bad. Oh, what just opened and closed there? We just saw a thing open and close. Okay, well, it's still orienting. Use landing checklist. Well, let's go back inside. I don't like the retro pack hanging out, but okay. 0.05 G. Rate indicator shows point. Uh, sorry, 10 degree per second roll rate. Uh, well, that was the rolling, yeah. Start landing checklist. Okay. Before 30,000 feet. Emergency. Oh, shoot. I missed that. Um, let me just beach start that checklist. Oh, I guess it's already true. Okay. Check drogue shoot deployment. And if it doesn't deploy, I'll have to manually deploy that. Drag is slowing us down. Okay, Drogue is out. All right. Okay, ring open. Out, emergency O2 handle. Out. Under 10,000 feet. I can turn off that beep. Okay, at 10,000 feet, main light green. Main is yellow or amber, and it is green already. Okay, we have to switch to HF now. Okay, press rig handle uh, out. Okay, landing bag tell light green, it is. After impact. Well, we'll wait for impact then. We're still descending through 10,000 feet according to the altimeter, external view. Looks like this. Hey, there's a carrier there. And the bag, you can see the bag really dark though. There we go. Snoopy. It actually puts the name on the capsule. Snoopy 3 is properly named. You can see our parachute there. Okay, brace for impact. Below 2,000 meters it looks like. Oh sorry, 2,000 feet. We're not exactly descending very fast. Oh, okay. Splash down, but hey, I need to turn that off. Let me turn that off. Oh, well, it's fine. Mission accomplished. I didn't actually do those two things, but it says it's fine, so we're good. Okay, well, 
I think I'll wrap it up here. That was four of these lessons, but we really need to do an orbital mission, I feel like. But I sort of want to relearn all the things as a priority. So we'll see. All right. So with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.